Yeah. There we ah, there we go. Good morning, Bereans. Welcome on this. Hello. Try it again. Yes. No. Switch back. Switch back. Yell loud. Yell loud. Is this? It is. Ah, okay. We'll try it again. Good morning. All right, there we go. I want to start with Psalm 85. The superscript on this says, Revive us again. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go up before him and make his footsteps away. I want you to stand with us, please, and let's praise the Lord. Here we go. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Alleluia, thank the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thank the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light. Who has shown us our Savior, has scattered our night. Hallelujah, thank the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory, revive us again. All glory.
a seat. Happy New Year. Say it back. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields his fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this simple and profound direction that we are not to be like the world. And when we walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, we are not blessed by you and we are not a blessing to you. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, that instead you direct us to delight, to delight, to delight in the law of the Lord and to meditate on it day and night. Thank you, Jesus, that um, that is uh, so good and so, and so deep, so right. Uh, may you bring the right increase in our life. Uh, thank you that you tell us we'll be like a tree and we'll produce our fruit and our leaves in season and we'll prosper um, instead of being blown around by the world. Thank you, Father, also for the end of the world and how you will set all things right And at the end of the world, we want to be in the congregation of the uh, righteous, not with the wicked or the sinners. Uh, So thank you, Jesus, that um, we do have a hope for heaven and a hope for future and a blessing that you will make all things right. In the present, we do struggle with sin and we do struggle with pain and we do struggle with night and we do struggle with loneliness and all the rest. Um, So, Father, thank you that... um, We do have a hope, but we also have a hope that to to live according to you is to have life and to life abundantly. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for your words. May we, uh, may you set us forth as we walk in truth and walk in love. So thank you that we can start a new year with a simple and good direction. Thank you that as we think of our plans for the new year and our hopes for the new year and our resolutions for the new year, that we would lay all those things at your feet. And say, Jesus, how would you have us walk? And we can plan our uh, way, but you will direct our steps. And that is best for us. We do pray that individually. We also pray that uh, corporately. We also pray that as a team, as a group, um, for a purpose in prayer. That Berean Bible Church may honor you. And that we may be um, setting our eyes forward on the things that you would have us set our eyes upon. Thank you for one another. Thank you for scripture, thank you for song, thank you for teaching, thank you for the Lord's Supper, and we ask that all these things this morning would be a pleasing aroma to you. We ask these things, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. He is risen, and God is good, and all the time. Welcome. I know it's not really Happy New Year because we had on Sunday, last Sunday, that was New Year, but we are uh, setting our eyes forward. Um, you can pray for us as a church and as a school. Uh, things turn back on this week. So tomorrow will be a faculty in service for teachers. Um, and then uh, Tuesday, the students come. Wednesday, or this is kind of a normal school week thereafter. And then also following that, the Awana calendar and the youth calendar start back. And so this coming Wednesday will be, to use the word, a normal Wednesday with uh, uh, getting back into this, um, the routine of things. So we look forward to that, and we're grateful for that. Uh, <clears throat> note on your calendars, in a few weeks, January 22nd, there will, uh, we'll be focusing on India that week, both the glasses and the Harris, I'm pointing back here, because this is where they stood when we prayed for them. Uh, they, we prayed for them, and they went to India, and they came back with many good reports, as well as... Uh, Jay and Sam will be here. There will be a combined Sunday school on, the, on January 22nd. Uh, so note that Sunday school teachers. Uh, so there won't be an individual class. It will all be in here. And then uh, Sunday the 22nd we'll have an evening meeting, which is a little rare for us to gather as a whole congregation, but we'll do that the 
uh, 22nd to hear a good report from India. So we look forward to that, and there's been a long history and heritage that has borne much good fruit. And we also say, Lord, what next? And how can we serve you in that? So that is coming up. Uh, women's Bible study will be back on, t- we have a prayer time on Tuesday morning from 9 to 10. It's a sweet time of prayer if you'd like to join us. And then the women's Bible study follows immediately after that from 10 uh, to 11 or so. Uh, so join us for that. And then Wednesday night will be normal Bible studies. Ladies game night is on the 13th, so that's not very far away either. Uh, it says 6 p.m. They usually stay pretty late. So uh, if you'd like to participate and join us, uh, we'd love to do that. Next Sunday will be a Christmas de-decorating time. I don't know if that's not as climactic as setting up for Christmas, but we'll be taking down Christmas. Uh, If you would like to stay and help with that, we'll do a pizza lunch, so to speak, so we can uh, do that immediately after the service. Uh, So that'll be next Sunday, just stay after church if you'd like to participate. And, as I said, we'll be looking forward to a normal week this week. Jed, come and give us a good word about a new Sunday school class. Got it? I wanted to make you aware, if you didn't hear or you saw it in the bulletin, we will be having a third adult Sunday school class starting up uh, next Sunday. It's called Life Together. We're going to focus on human relationships. I was thinking of really two things that we hear often. Maybe you've heard someone say, I love my job. It's the people that are the problem, (laughs) right? And then maybe you've heard other people say, I just wish I could connect with others. And really that encapsulates two issues we have. We know relationships are good and we want them. And we also know they're really hard. Right. And so what we would like to do, uh, Brian Todd and I will be heading up this class, we're going to work through talking about the biblical foundation for relationships. We're not going to give you every answer for every relationship problem. We don't have long enough or enough wisdom to do that. But we'd like to point you to some truths that God has told us about relationships and then say, so how do we apply those in some different situations in our lives? As coworkers, as family, as neighbors, all kinds of different things that we wrestle with. How do we do human relationships in a God-honoring way? We'd like to be able to have the opportunity as a group to discuss that. I do want to say one other thing about that is I know at the new pastor, the temptation might be to make this a, hey, you can come get to know me kind of thing. That's not the point of this. I would love for you to get to know me. I'd love to do that in another context. We want there to be three strong adult Sunday school classes going. So especially if you're not currently plugged into a Sunday school class, we would love to have you come and be a part of that discussion. Uh, There'll be other opportunities in the future for other things like that. We'd love to have some of you come, especially if you say maybe you're new here or maybe you, uh, you had a stage of life where you weren't coming to Sunday school and you think, I'd like to get back plugged into that. We'd love to have you come and be a part of it where we can talk through some of these things. It will not be just lecture. If you come, the goal is not for you to come and sit there and say nothing because we are talking about relationships after all. We want the people who are there to build relationships within the time as well, to be able to grow in knowing one another. Some of you sit in this room and you say, I don't, I don't know plenty of the people here. This would be a good opportunity for you to do that. So next Sunday, Sunday school time, we'll be meeting. We're going to meet up in the, the upper room, if you know where that is. That's the youth room up the hill over the gym. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be meeting there during that Sunday school time. If you have any questions, please feel free to come ask me or Brian, and we'll try to help you get those answers. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, finally, this morning, I'd like to give a word of thank you and a word of testimony. Um, the last month, I've had experiences I've never had before. So I had some back pain, which is mostly new to me. And then I went to the doctor and got some soft meds, and it got worse. Not because of the doctor, it just just got worse. And then I couldn't get out of bed, like shooting pain through my back. I couldn't stand up. I I didn't know what that, I was sure I'd slipped a disc or broken something or something major. Um, I limped back to the doctor, got an x-ray, and he said, yeah, you're mostly fine from the x-ray. Take these stronger meds. I did. 
And then I ended up in the ER because my, my throat swelled slot, uh, which I know I'm making light of it. It was a little bit of a scary experience to have a swollen throat. I could breathe through my nose, so that was, a, to use the expression, not made it not a crisis. But I had to go to the ER, and then they kept me for a day. And then um, I got an MRI there, and they said, you're mostly fine from the MRI. Um, so all that to say, my back muscles got too tight. Um, and so now I'm doing these weird yoga stretches, and I had to take a steroid pack, and um, uh, I um, am grateful for a couple things. Um, one of them is your um, faithful and consistent prayer and care from this body. So thank you for many of you for helping our family or reaching out um, and um, being a point of service. Um, <clears throat> In God's wisdom, he makes some physical parallels, spiritual parallels, because he helps us understand the body of Christ by using the physical body as, as, as an example. Um, a couple truths that have come out of that for me is um, physically, I need to do one thing at a time. And as strange as that sounds, now I put my legs over the bed and now I stand up in the morning. Um, I, I, I move a little more slowly, but I move a little bit more on purpose. And I, I, I guess there's, I guess as I read the Gospels, I also, maybe as in this, this has brought it home a little more clearly, um, I think Jesus was a one thing at a time kind of guy. And I think that he focused on the person in front of him. And I think he spent some deep time in prayer that I get distracted and I ping around a lot. And I think this has helped me to say one thing at a time. That's good. Um, pain also helps you prioritize, helps you say what is the most, when, when I couldn't get out of bed, I had to cancel my meetings for the day, obviously, um, and uh, what floated to the surface in my heart and mind were, I'm grateful for my family, I'm grateful for my church family, I'm grateful for my school family, I'm grateful for, it, it kind of helps you prioritize, and I think that when you go into the new year and you set resolutions and you say, What's the best thing for me, and how should I lean forward? Um, maybe I'm. Maybe for me, it's a call to simplicity. Um, maybe for me, it's a call to love your family, uh, care about the most, imp spend the most important, spend the most amount of energy on the most important things in your life. Um, and then finally, I'm I'm doing these really weird stretches. I think they're helping, um, and I think I'm. One of them is you, it's just a spine stretch thing, like you just lay on the ground and stretch out your, you walk your fingers as far as you can that way, and you push your heels as far as you can that way, and, and you hold it for like a minute or two, and it just stretches your spine, and I know this isn't a medical answer, but I get up and I feel better. It's, I, again, this isn't a medical answer, but I feel like there's light in my back. I feel like it's not just locked up. Um... Psalm 119.8 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And, and I'm making the parallel between physically stretching and spiritually stretching. Or the, or the spiritual discipline of, I want to I read scripture before I check a screen. Um, I want to have a spiritual discipline in my life before I need it. Um, I'm stretching before I need it kind of thing. That discipline of I'm going to do my stretches in the morning and at noon and at night, whether I feel it or not, so that I'm not just trying to solve a problem, so that I'm trying to be healthy. And I think there's a spiritual level to that as well, that I want to um, be spiritually healthy and spiritually stretched so that my body doesn't lock up with sin or temptation, but there's light in it and there's God's word hidden in my heart. So I, I, I use that as a word of thank you. I use that as a word of testimony. And I will say for the first time in my life, I'm grateful that I can stand up. And I know some of you live that life. That has been a new experience for me in the last month. And I say praise God. And I want to be a good example of, um, of uh, gratitude and testimony. So thank you. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
All right, let's come back together. Here's an old one I learned as a, gosh, I guess I was nine or ten when I heard this one for the first time. But it's a great old hymn. We're going to do first verse, chorus, verses two and four, two in a row, and then a chorus, and then two in a row and a chorus. Okay. And we have a new piano player. Within my heart, a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. Fear not, what I said and flow. Jesus, 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 sweet as day, my God.
seated. I want to talk about the cross for just a few minutes. Have you ever met anybody that disagreed with you about the cross and its necessity? They're saying something maybe like, that's just too much blood and violence for me. I can't believe in a God like that. I have worked with some people like that. What do you say? What do you say? I mean, they're with you right up till that point, right? Yeah, Jesus was a great guy. Well, Hebrews 9 tells us that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And we see that all the way back into the law from Moses, or from Abraham, really. When, uh, well, back to Adam and Eve, God slew the first animal as a covering for man. He took care of them. They tried fig leaves. He said, nope, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it this way. There has to be blood. Coming on up, New Testament. Galatians 1, Paul said this, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1.18, as the, the, uh, the Greeks in Corinth liked to discuss things with each other and see who was the sharpest, who had the most on the ball. Paul said, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's the cross. As far as humility, Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, said, in being found in human form, he, God himself, in the form of Jesus, became obedient. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we see the cross again. In the cross, we make peace, Colossians 1.20. For in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And further in, in Colossians, verse 12 in chapter 13 and 14 in chapter 2, And you who were dead in your trespasses, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's that bill. You ever get, get a bill at a restaurant? They give you a bill. They expect you to pay it, right? We have a bill from the creator of the universe. But praise him, his son has paid that. And Paul says here, nailing it to the cross. Galatians 2.20. I bet you can all repeat that with me. I am crucified with Christ. Okay. I am crucified with Christ. Let me get it exactly right here. Yes. Yeah. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the cross, the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, is where we need to be. It's our debt that has been paid there by him. Horatio Spafford, in one of my favorite hymns ever, It Is Well With My Soul, his third verse says, My sin, 
Oh, the bliss of, the glory, of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Even so, it is well with my soul. The hymn we're going to do next, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, is just a prayer that we not forget the importance nor the power of of the cross, and that as we continue to stumble from time to time, to remember that that has been paid, we just need to turn to the cross and confess it to Jesus.
Does everybody have the elements, the unleavened bread and the grape juice? If not, raise your hand and they could provide you one from the back. And we encourage those of you who trust in Christ as our Savior to partake, and we'll understand that as we talk about this remembrance. I've been reading through the book of Matthew, and I realized as I was reading through that and as um, we've been going through the book of John uh, with Lynn, just how much, how great a portion of the Gospels are dedicated to the last week or Passion Week from Christ's entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey called the Triumphal Entry to his resurrection the following Sunday, from Palm Sunday to Easter. It's like one-fifth of the Gospels is that week. When you think about it, though, it's a culmination of history as we look backwards in time as well as the Old Testament prophets look forward in time. And as I was contemplating this, I have thought I should never ask anybody how their week went again. <laughs> or I should never say, oh, I had a bad week. Or, oh, I had a great week. Because so much happened that week. Um, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on the back of the colt. People throwing their coats and palm leaves down at the entry of the king. He stays at Bethany a few nights. He curses a fig tree. He sees a fig tree withered the next day. He cleanses a temple. He speaks woes on the people who would see him dead against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those, his enemies. He gives the Olivet Discourse about what's going to happen in the end times. Judas bargains with the Sanhedrin. They prepare for Passover. They go to the upper room where he institutes this remembrance that we are celebrating today. He washes feet. Judas departs. He goes with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays for his disciples in the upper room. He prays for us as well, that we would be one. Um, 
In Gethsemane, he prays to his father that this cup would be taken away, but not his will, but God's will. He's arrested. Several trials occur. Annas, Annas's house, Caiaphas's house. Then he goes to in front of the Sanhedrin as part of that, and Pilate, then the Herod back to Pilate again. He's sentenced to death. Barabbas is released in his stead. Um, he is scourged. He carries his cross to Golgotha. It's carried part way there by someone else. He is crucified. He is sentenced to death. Judas hangs himself after he flings his ill-gotten gain in front of the priest. Uh, one of the thieves mocks him. The other will go with him to paradise. The words spoken on the cross are not words of judgment. The words of caring and mercy because he came the first time to save us from our sin. He wasn't coming in judgment. What does he say? Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do to the people that are killing him. To the thief, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. To his mother, woman, behold your son. To John, behold your mother. I thirst. He was man. He had physical suffering. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then it is finished. What was started is finished. Anyway, his death was confirmed. The spear was stuck in his side. He's laid in the tomb of a rich man. A stone is rolled across the grave and a guard is set. The disciples go into hiding in a most telling and convincing verse to me I read in Matthew twenty six fifty six. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. That was after his arrest. And unfortunately, I'm in that group more often than not. Do we forsake Christ? But at the end of the week, he rose from the dead. And that's the phrase we say. He is risen, just as, we, as he said. It's interesting, during that week, in the middle of in that week, he reminded the disciples in that week what was going to happen. In 26.2, he says, you know that after two days is a Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And it happened just as he said. But even before the week, he told them what was going to happen. It said in Matthew 20, 17 to 19, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. It happened just as he said. Well, in fact, when it was all over, they still didn't understand, so he had to explain it again to some of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Right? O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It happened just as the scripture said, just as he said the word of God. So it was prophesied way before the week. Christ taught it during the week. And after the week, he explained what had happened, just as he said. So, you get back to the garden. Why did he pray in the garden? Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. But he knew this from the foundation of the earth all the way through in history past that was going to happen. So he prayed to his God, why do I want this cup to pass from me? And see, not too long, right before this, at this thing we were going to remember, he told the disciples, he took the bread, he blessed it, and says, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, and he gave thanks for something he's going to pray for, that God would take away from him. He gave thanks to the cup, and he said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. But it didn't stop there. It's shed for many for the remission or forgiveness of sin. Have you all seen the movie Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ? I, I've seen it. It's a, a horrific movie. It pictures how realistically, how horrific Christ's suffering was. But there's something that movie could never picture and it did not picture. And this is par probably perhaps the true agony of the cross. And I don't want to treat lightly the suffering and death of Christ. It was truly horrific. But our holy and righteous God, Jesus Christ, creator of the universe, our maker was made sin. That we might have remission from our sins, just as he said. And it's unfathomable and it's very difficult to understand. I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever fully comprehend 
the magnitude of the agony of the Son of God taking my sin on him. That was the true agony of the cross. Because Jesus knew this was all going to happen, but he had never felt my sin on him, our sin on him, the sin of the world on him, my covetousness, lust, lewdness, selfishness, love of money, wickedness, evil thoughts, lying, cheating, causing strife, pride, boasting, disobedient, undiscerning, unmerciful, untrustworthy, loving the things of the world rather than the things of God, and not enjoying the presence of God, not obeying God, wanting to take credit for things that I had nothing to do with, not giving him honor when it's due him. God made Jesus all these things and more. God made him sin. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ was made sin, the agony of the cross. And it was planned long before that week. It says in Revelation, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. In Isaiah, it says, he was smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All of you like sheep have gone astray, like those disciples that ran away. We have turned away every one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The righteous servant will justify many and shall bear their iniquities. He poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. And you know the, the wonderful thing? He did it of his own accord. Pilate bragged. He says, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered and said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. And he told his disciples before that in John, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. This command I have received from my father. So back in the garden, he says, if it is possible that this cup cup pass from me nevertheless not as I will but as you will the cup of being made sin who knew no sin of bearing my sin and my iniquities it's indescribable it all fits together I, I have loved this worship this morning the songs we sang about God becoming sin for us in fact, even after the week was over and Christ was ready to ascend into heaven, in Luke it says, Christ talked to his disciples before he ascended, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. So let's get the cup ready and let's remember that God became sin on our behalf. So Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission, for the forgiveness of sin. You'll take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Also, if children aren't dismissed yet for Children's Church, I don't think you have, you can be dismissed for Children's Church now. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to take just a moment, and in a hopefully non-awkward way, I'd like you to just look around the room and see the people who are here 
And as you do, I'd like you to just think of as many names as you can think of, of people that you see. Just look around. See the people who are here. And I'd like you to ask this question of yourself, and you can think about it for others. Why are you here? This morning, if you came to Sunday school, you can ask about Sunday school. Why are you at Sunday school? Those people that you just named who are your friends, I hope, I hope they're not your enemies, why are they here? Why should you be here? And if you know why that person should be here, at least some reasons, how can you help them to be here for the right reasons? Sometimes it's easy to get caught up thinking about the people who aren't here. And I know you could name a lot of names, some people who you really wish were here. And that's good. But it's good for us to remember we're here. So why? Over the next five weeks, I want to remind you in a nutshell of some of the core values of Berean Bible Church of our church, and I'm really glad that I can say our church. And I think there are a lot of reasons why it's important to do this. Maybe you remember the story of Vince Lombardi at the beginning of a football season. You say, I don't know who Vince Lombardi is. It's okay. Football coach, really good one. He comes into this NFL locker room, and he holds up a football. And some of you know what he said. He says, gentlemen... This is a football. These guys have been professional athletes for however long. They practically grew up with a football in their hand. They know what a football is. But it's important to remember the basics. And by the way, they went on and won a title because they focused on the fundamentals. They understood, why are we here to get that ball across that line? If you're on a football field and you're confused by that, there's a problem. Right. We need to know the basics. We need to know core values. Uh, there's a man named Jim Collins. Maybe some of you know him from some of his writings from Good to Great. Would be one example. He said, this is interesting. He said, core values are essential for enduring greatness, but it doesn't seem to matter what those core values are. Now, as a Christian, I want to say, depends on how long you want to endure. You want enduring greatness for your lifetime, maybe. You can be committed to certain principles, and it may not matter that much which ones as long as you're committed. But if you want to endure into eternity, it matters which core values you stick with. As a church, we need to know when we meet, when we plan, when we sing, we need to know why we do what we do. And that is not just a, co- a church leadership issue. Anytime you're here, Gathering with God's people as part of Berean Bible Church, it is helpful for everyone to know, why are we here? What are we doing? What are the core values that drive us? Not only do we need to be reminded ourselves, we need to be able to tell others. If someone comes and asks you, hey, what's your church about? Can you give an answer? I hope so, and I think we probably all could, but we might not have thought about it. I want to... This is going to be the real nutshell version. I want to give three different ways of saying the overview of what I'm going to say over the next five weeks. So if you really like summaries, I guess you can hear that and not listen for five weeks, but I hope you won't do that. It's important to be able to say it different ways because some of you are teachers in this room. You know that's that's how you teach. If you can only say it one way and the student's not getting it, you're in trouble. So to be able to say it multiple ways is helpful. I'm going to say it three ways. We want to be a group of people who are rooted in the gospel that we find in God's word so that we exalt God as the greatest treasure, support one another as brothers and sisters, and love those outside of this family with God's love flowing through us. That one's a little long. Probably not an elevator speech. Probably not something any of us are going to memorize. That's fine. I could put it more succinctly and say, We want to be people who rely on God's word, live by the gospel, and overflow in worship, community, and mission. 
That's closer. I might be able to remember that one. But that's saying what we want to be. I could phrase it a little differently. Notice the common threads. My prayer is that Berean Bible Church will help you individually and anyone else who comes to be a humble, confident, wholehearted worshiper who has joy-filled community with one another and loves their neighbor as themselves. We're grounded in the gospel. We rely on God's word to even know the gospel. We're related rightly to God in worship, rightly to each other in relationships and community, and rightly to those outside with mission. If what we do as a church can help us all to grow like that, it's worthwhile. And it's enduring for eternity because that's what God wants to do with his people. Now, these reasons may not be the forefront of your mind. You say, I come in and I sit down at church. I haven't thought about that every Sunday. Am I doing something wrong? No, it's okay. But I want these things to be well-marked and well-worn trails in our mind. So that when you think, I'm coming to church, why? Because I'm rooted in the gospel, I rely on God's word, and I love God, I love my brothers and sisters, and I love others. That should be a trail that you can just run through easily. So somebody says, what's your church about? We love the gospel, God's word, worship, community, mission. Five things. Five Sundays. You can figure out how that'll look. So my prayer is that today we'll focus particularly on the gospel. What is it that unites us about the gospel? And if you say, I've heard the gospel a million times, great. I hope that you'd say, I love to hear that story told over and over and over again. But we're going to talk about what the gospel is from 1 Peter, and then we're going to at the end say, what should the gospel create in me? That was convicting for me as I thought through that, because it's easy for me to say I believe the gospel, and then over here, I'm not really living like someone who believes the gospel. You'll see as we get there. Let's pray before we do that because we need God's help. Father, as we looked at last Sunday, you must build the house, you must build the family, you must build the church or those who build it labor in vain. I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. As John read this morning, your word says, the one who delights in your word is like a tree planted by rivers of water. Lord, we confess our hearts are often hard, we're often distracted. We ask that you give us hearts that delight in your word. In Christ's name, amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, if I said I was preaching on the gospel, that may not have been the passage you first thought of. It's not the one I'd go to for evangelism. It's not the one I'd go to to tell my neighbor, what is the gospel and how can you believe in Christ? But it is about the gospel. He begins this book, if you just look at verse 1 and 2, we won't read it, but he says, I'm writing to the elect exiles. And he describes them, says a few things about who they are as it relates to a God who is is triune, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And then he gives a standard greeting, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And then Peter just explodes in worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This word, blessed, in, in English, we use it a couple different ways. So if you go to the Beatitudes, you'll see the word blessed, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. The word in Greek is not the same. There, it would have something to do with happy or joy-filled. Here, it, it literally, and you have to be careful with this kind of thing, but literally, if it's two words put together that mean good words. Now, we know not every compound word means the combination of those two. For example, a butterfly has nothing to do with butter. Right? We know that doesn't always work. But in this case, as you look at it, he is saying good words. May God be praised. May good words be said about God. That's basically blessed in this context. As I thought about preaching on the gospel, I was tempted to begin with our sin and our need for salvation. We often will hear something like that. Maybe someone will say, you have to get people 
lost before you get them saved. And there's, there's a certain logical order, and that's very good. There's a place for that. You have to get people to recognize their sin before they can come to faith in Christ. That is true. But that's not the way Peter goes to it. And admittedly, he's not trying to talk to an unsaved neighbor here. But that's not where he starts. He starts with worship. And this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but it got me thinking, as I talk to somebody who doesn't believe in Christ, if my first thought is, how can I get them to see they're a sinner? I think I missed one really important step. And that is, how can I get them to see that my salvation means something to me? If you ask this question, if you have unsaved, say, neighbors, coworkers, do they know that your salvation through the gospel, even if they can't understand all that it is, do they know it's important to you? If I look at my neighbor and my first goal is, how can I make sure they know what they're doing is terrible, that, that may not be the best approach. If somebody comes to you and they tell you, I see how you're handling your life at home, whatever, maybe your mom or dad, I see how you're handling your kids and you're doing it all terribly, you are probably not going to receive that the same way as somebody that you see and you say, this is how we handle our life at home, and it is wonderful. It means so much to me. Can I tell you how that happens? You're a whole lot more likely to listen. Now, we know there are people who are blinded by their sin everywhere. So we know no matter how you present the gospel, that does not mean everybody is going to come to faith in Christ. It's God's power that gives growth. We plant seeds. We know that. But I would ask this question to you. Do the people around you, start in this room because this is the easiest place you're going to do it. Do the people in this room know how much the gospel means to you? Do they know how much it impacts your life? How much it matters that, and we'll get there, but how much it matters that I don't have to earn favor before God by my works? Do people around you know that? End of rabbit trail. Back to 1 Peter 1.3. He explodes in this worship. Let praises be given to God because he's worthy of that praise. And we say, well, why? There's a million reasons. But let's look at specifically the one Peter uses here. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He doesn't use the word grace here. But that's what it is. It's God's favor giving us something that we could never earn by our performance. Something we do not and we could not deserve. He's caused us to be born again. He's given us new life, new desires. And he describes the means of this salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, he doesn't spell out everything that many of you at least in this room would know about Jesus. But he's describing salvation. So we have to say, what are we saved from? That's important. We could say everything in this world that's bad. Ultimately, we could trace it back to the fact that we have a broken world full of death and decay, weakness and emptiness. We have a world where our bodies run down. We get sick. Where death happens, not only to the people we say you've lived a full life, but sometimes to people who surely have not lived a full life. We live in that kind of broken world. Not only that, we live in a world, and this really, Scripture says, is the root of that. We live in a world where there's human guilt. Now, I know we don't like to look at our own human guilt, so for a minute, just think about how much human guilt there is not thinking of you, around you. How many people do things that you say, that's wrong? Not only is there guilt because we've done wrong, we have rebellious hearts. Parents or grandparents, when you interact with children, you know sometimes they technically haven't done anything wrong yet, but you can see what's going on in their heart to some degree. We'd normally say you see their attitude, right? And you go, you technically aren't guilty of breaking this command yet, but there's still a huge problem. 
We know that. As parents, teachers, you work with children, it's easy to see. If you work with adults, it's also easy to see. We hide it a little better, sometimes. We live in a world that's got this problem. We are all humans, so we can personalize it, and we can say, there's a broken world, I stand guilty before God, and I have a rebellious heart. The gospel is not just that you can be saved from one of those. The gospel is that you can be saved from all three of those. That's what we need to be saved from. How does that work through Jesus? We'll get there in just a second. But let's also ask, well, we're saved from that. What are we saved to? You might say something like, well, we're saved to forgiveness. And if you tell somebody on the street that who hasn't grown up in church, they might say, do I even care? Do I want to be forgiven? Probably many of us have grown up, we've heard God's word preached, and we say, oh, forgiveness, that's a good thing. But think about, you probably want to be forgiven if you've done something wrong to a family member. You might want to be forgiven. Do you care if a terrorist in the middle of Afghanistan forgives you that you're not living the kind of life they want you to live? I highly doubt it. Probably none of us even think about it. Like, they don't even know me. It doesn't matter. That's the way somebody out on the street feels. You say, oh, you can be forgiven by God. Who is this God? Do I even care? Do I want to be forgiven? I don't know. You say, well, how about if we say, save to eternal life? By the way, it's okay to say forgiveness is a blessing of the gospel. That's part of what we're saved to. But it's not all of it. We could say eternal life. How many of you would like to live forever exactly the way you are right now? None of us. I saw some kids shaking their head. There's a reason for that. Now, it's a different reason than maybe on the other end. The kids are going, I want to grow up. I don't want to be six forever. I want to do some of those other cool adult things. And the adults are saying, I want to do some of those cool kid things. I want to be able to, as John would say, I want to be able to get out of bed and not think about it. Eternal life is wonderful, but if eternal life just means we live forever like we are now, that's not really good news. But you can be saved to something more than that. Psalm 16, 11 says, In God's presence there is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. The best thing about the gospel, about salvation, is not forgiveness, although it's wonderful. It's not eternal life, although that's wonderful. It's that you can know God. You can have the joy of knowing God himself forever. And all of the blessings that come with that. That's what we're saved to. I think that's one reason sometimes we don't treasure the gospel as much as we should because we forget how good it is. If the gospel is only oh, shoo, I don't have to go to hell. That's a wonderful thing, but it's only part of it. The gospel is more than that. We need to be saved from the fact that you live in a broken world where bad things happen. You live in a world where people and you are guilty before a holy God. And we live in a world where all of us have rebellious hearts that would turn us from the greatest joy of knowing God to everything else. So you say, well, that sounds like a great salvation. If we really think about it, it probably sounds too good to be true if you haven't heard the gospel before. So how will that salvation be available? He tells you in verse 3, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God cannot just wink and pass over sin. We know that, but think of the logic of it. If he did... He would have to go against his nature as a just God. Now, I just said the highest good, the best thing you can have about the gospel is you can know God himself. So if God then is not just, now God is not the highest, best thing you can imagine, right? You'd say, no, I can't. I would want a God who rules the universe who is just. There's a lot of injustice in the world. I want that. So if God were to just wink and say, you know what? 
I know there was a whole bunch of that sin stuff, but it's okay, just come and enjoy me anyway. He would actually be undermining the goal of salvation, which is knowing the perfect God. God is not giving you salvation by just winking and saying, it's okay, come on in, you're fine. He can't do that. That would be to go against his character. That would be to make him not truly God. So instead, what does he do? And we know this answer, but I'd like you to hear again, to think again. This is why we gather. At, if we had to pick one reason, we gather because Jesus died for us. Why do we sing? Because Jesus died for us. It's not because you like the music. It's not because you're here with friends. It's not because that's what you've always done. Because Jesus died for us and was raised. That's the gospel. That's the one thing, if you have to pick one, that's why we're here. God, who exists in three persons, did something only he could do. He took the most humiliating, in the sense of humbling yourself, the most humiliating step possible. The second person of the Trinity, the Son, took on himself humanity. He was truly human, but with one difference. He had no sin. That means he faced the temptation to complain, just like you do. He faced the temptation to threaten other people when they threatened and beat him. He faced the temptation to slander others when they said bad things about him and his teaching. He faced the temptation to envy the prosperity of others. And every other sin that you've ever faced the temptation for. And he never gave in to that temptation. Ever. Even in his mind. Completely perfect, without sin, and then without fighting back, he submits himself to ridicule, shame, and a brutal death on the cross. By living a perfect life, he provided a right standing before God. By dying the death he didn't deserve, he made it possible for your and my guilty standing to be removed. I said one of the problems was we have a guilty standing. We come before God in his courtroom and we are guilty. And Jesus came not only paid the penalty for that, but lived a perfect life so that you could say not just not guilty, but righteous. That's what Jesus did. You say, well, you said guilty standing. I've got this rebellious heart. Did Jesus do anything about that? When he institutes the Lord's Supper, this is the New Testament, the New Covenant In my blood. What's promised in the new covenant? A new heart. Jesus is going to transform our hearts by his blood, by the death, which is what what Peter says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That means he had to die and he was raised. By his blood, he forms a new community that can have transformed hearts that are transformed and truly new now and will be perfectly transformed one day. Two problems, my guilty standing, Jesus paid the penalty and gave me his righteousness. My rebellious heart, he says, by my blood, I will transform your heart. But there's one more problem, that's we have a broken world. But Jesus solves that too because Jesus was raised from the dead. Death is kind of the ultimate expression of the brokenness of this world, right? It winds down. It's always something you say, I just wish they could have lived a a little bit longer. Because Jesus was raised, what will happen with us? We will be raised. Because Jesus is raised, he can say, I will make all things new. This is what we're saved to. This kind of salvation, the kind that can deal with the brokenness of everything in the world, our guilty standing, and our rebellious heart, that can only come One way, and that's if God does this through Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way to have this kind of salvation. And so Peter says, according 
to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. No one could earn this salvation. Now, probably in this room we all know this, but you've talked to people who would say, I mean, is my sin really that bad? Like, to deserve hell? Is my sin really that awful? I mean, I've done some good things too. Maybe, maybe there's something kind of in the middle. But it misses the point. There's only two options. You can be in God's presence forever with joy, perfect, infinite, eternal joy, or you can be separated from him, which is what hell is. All right, so the question is not, are my sins bad enough to deserve hell? That, that's kind of irrelevant, although it's true. The question is, have you lived a good enough life to deserve perfect, infinite joy forever? All of us say no. How could you? Only one person could, and that's Jesus. You can't earn this salvation, but with that lens, think back on what Peter says. Blessed be, praised be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, not because you've earned it, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance. What is your inheritance? We actually sing it sometimes. You think of, be thou my vision, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise, thou my inheritance. What's the greatest goal of the gospel? Knowing God and enjoying him. That's your inheritance and all the blessings that come with it. He describes this inheritance with three words, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Anything you get here on this earth is not those three things. If you have a treasure now, there are some treasures that are perishable. We don't think of it as treasure, but if you think of certain foods, if you have a gallon of milk, at some point you say, I'm not going to drink that. Some of us probably have different places where that happens, right? It might be right on the date it says, it might be after, it might be before. But there's some point where you say, this is no longer good. Peter is saying, the inheritance you have of knowing Jesus, it is always going to be good. It's never going to perish. It's undefiled. It isn't a mixed bag. See, in this life, you get lots of joys at different stages of life. But you also get some sadnesses along the way. You might talk, think of, as I've enjoyed having Shiloh have a baby, and there's so much joy in having a baby. There's also so many sleepless nights in having a baby. And you could do that for every stage of life. There's some joys. It's mixed. The inheritance and joy you have of knowing God is not mixed. It's undefiled. It's perfect joy. It's unfading. It won't even lose its shine. We're, what, two weeks after Christmas? I'm sure there are some kids who have now forgotten a present that they got on Christmas that they were super excited about. And adults do it too. Things fade. The inheritance you have of knowing God as a believer in Jesus Christ does not fade. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, and unfading. So if you have that inheritance that's given to you by God's grace, can we know for sure that we will reach it? And we could go through a lot of other passages, but just look at the way he says it here. Into verse 4, that inheritance is kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Where is your inheritance? It's in heaven. That means nobody can break in and steal it. That means your inheritance of future eternal joy is as safe as God is in heaven. If someone can break in and take God out of his heaven, then they can steal your future hope. It's in heaven, kept for you, who are being guarded by God's power through faith. God opens your eyes to believe, and he sustains you in your belief. God has given grace. Here's the salvation that's available. We must be connected to that 
by faith and not works, because if we were connected by, here, I've done all these good things, then you'd say, I earned it. I can boast I'm better than that guy. And it doesn't matter if you boast in all the good that you've done or all the bad things you've done. There are people who boast in that too. It doesn't matter if you boast in being in church every Sunday or if you boast in being kind to people around you. We aren't saved because we earned salvation. That's the truth of the gospel. We're saved because God in His grace has given this to you. And we are held by faith. As one song said, I think it's a great illustration, it's called Good and Gracious King, it says, I approach the throne of glory, nothing in my hands I bring, but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious king. Christians have the, we could say, audacity to take the long journey of life looking with confidence into God's presence and bringing absolutely nothing with you to say you should accept me except, God, you said that you would through Jesus. That's what we come. We say, you've said you will give me favor if I come trusting only in Christ. That's what Christians do. That's the gospel. We trust in nothing else, only that he has said he will accept us. Biblical saving faith is exclusive. You can't come saying, I trust in Jesus alone, but also I did these good works. Will you make sure that you notice those, God? You can't come saying, I trust in Jesus alone, but also I'm going to kind of hang on to this sin over here because I think it'll satisfy me more than God will. We come saying, there is only One way I can enter into full and lasting joy, knowing God forever. That's because he promised I could through Jesus. As soon as you bring something else to earn salvation, you are dishonoring God and his son. Jesus said, I'm enough, trust me. And you come saying, you're not quite enough, I'm going to do something else. The gospel is the news we cannot be saved if we trust in our righteousness. We can't be saved if we trust in our sins. We have to turn from trusting in any of those things and say, I am saved by grace alone because God said he'd save me through Jesus. And if I sound like a broken record, good. If there's anything that we need to hear over and over, it's that I am saved Because God has bestowed his favor that I did not deserve by grace and that I access it not by earning anything or anything I can boast in, but saying, I believe you, Father. We ought to be people who that comes across our mind over and over and over. The gospel doesn't tell you that you can be excused like, oh, you understand why I did all these wrong things. It tells you I did all kinds of wrong things, but it's a whole lot better than being excused. I can be forgiven. You know, when someone's done something wrong to you, you don't really want to hear, well, here's why I did it. And I had this really good reason that I snapped at you and said this really mean thing. What you want to hear is, that was wrong, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Would you forgive me? When we come to God, the gospel is not you can be excused, like your sin's not really that bad. It's you can be forgiven. The gospel doesn't tell you that you can just fix the external things. It tells you you can be transformed internally. The gospel doesn't just tell you you can survive a world that's broken. It tells you God will make all things new. And all of that will happen not because you or I earned it. Now, we could talk about the gospel for a really long time. There's one thing that I want to do here at the end of our time together and say, okay, I'm going to assume most of you in the room could have probably, you would have said things differently, but the core structure of the gospel, you would have said probably the same things. And that's good. That's wonderful. So since we're rooted in the gospel, what kind of people should the gospel create? And I want you to ask these questions about yourself. Am I like this? The gospel should create humble, open, confident, 
forgiving worshipers. Notice I did not list the word perfect. The gospel doesn't create perfect people right now. He does create people who will be perfect because they're made like him because they see him as he is. But not right now. We should be humble because the gospel says I have nothing to boast in. I don't come and say, here's what I have done. I come and say, here's what Jesus has done. For by grace you save through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We should be humble. Somebody comes and says, you Christians think you're better than everybody else. Not a chance. I know I'm terrible. But I still have that salvation that God gives. We should be humble. We should be open because our standing is not built on our performance. Are you willing to talk to somebody? Start with the easy ones, your family members, and say, you know, I did something there that was wrong. Is that hard for you to say sometimes? We should be open because we're not earning favor with anybody because we've done right stuff. We're saying, God has given me grace through Jesus. We should be open. Paul is, I'm the chief of sinners. And we sit there and go, Paul, you're like doing missionary journeys and all this great stuff. I'm the chief of sinners. Why can he say that? Because Paul also can say in 1 Corinthians 4, With me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Paul says the thing that matters is, does God judge me as righteous? And he does that based on Jesus, not my performance. So I can say, I am the chief of sinners. But praise God for what he's done for me in Jesus. We should be open. We should be confident because of the gospel. Because if your salvation depends on you, you're done. And so am I. If your salvation depends on you earning it, you stand no chance. That's why Paul says in Romans 4, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. If you come to God through faith, then your confidence is guaranteed. Because if you sin tomorrow, that doesn't make you not saved. You weren't saved based on your your righteousness in the first place. You were saved based on Jesus. That is why it depends on faith that it would be guaranteed. We should be humble, open, confident, forgiving worshipers. Because if you think, I never could earn my standing before God, I've blown it a million times, then when that person comes and they sin against you, you say, that's what I've done to God over and over. And he's shown grace. If God has poured oceans worth of grace on you, then even if you have to carry a bucket worth of grace for that person next to you every day for the rest of your life, it's still so much less than God's given you. Is your life characterized by humility, openness, confidence, forgiveness? That's what the gospel should create in us. That was convicting to me to think of those four things. Because I can look back this week at conversations I had with my wife and say, was I really humble? No. Was I really open in admitting my wrong? No, I wanted to justify myself. Was I confident in God's work? Or was I trying to work everything out myself? Was I so quick to forgive? Not always. But praise God, the gospel is not about God saving people because we are good. It's about God saving people because He is good. That's why we're gathered here together. That's what we're rooted in. And that's what I want to go to my grave loving and proclaiming. Say, this is the salvation that we have Not by works, lest any man should boast, but by the grace that God has given us. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you that our standing with you and our hope to be delivered from our rebellious hearts and from this broken world is not based on anything that we could do, but on your lavish, overflowing grace. Lord, make us people who are humble before you and before each other. Make us people who are open, who willingly recognize our sin, who confess it, not excuse it, but people who are confident that our sin does not ultimately condemn us because we come by faith to Jesus Christ and all that He has done for us. Lord, we come before You with nothing except Your promise that we can come and that we can come boldly before Your throne of grace. I pray that we would be people who can communicate this truth That people around us would know how much it means that we are delivered from the guilt of our sin. How much it means to us that we can have this kind of confidence and this kind of humility. How much it means to us that we no longer need to be enslaved to performing and trying to live up to your expectations to get your favor. But that we have been given your grace. I pray that people all around us this area, our neighborhood, that people in Knoxville as we go out to our houses, to our jobs, that people would know Berean Bible Church is a church full of people who love Jesus and who come to God through Him alone. And I pray in all of these things that you would be honored and worshipped in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. To close, I'm just going to read a verse from Revelation. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen.